Welcome back. This show explores the idea that we've all been here before, but it's about your perspective and what you believe to be true. So far, we've regressed TV personality and DJ Lisa Ianson to a past life where she has vivid recollections that she was a monk in Italy in 1739. There's a fire over the wall. There's a fire. People died. The fire burnt everything. So where did all this information come from? Was Lisa really tapping into a former life, or was it a story that she just dragged out of her imagination? There are many arguments for and against the idea that we've all lived before, but in the end, it always comes down to one thing. What do you believe? Very often in these past life regressions, people will either be religious figures or they'll come into contact with religious figures. And I think this reflects the fact that people think of the whole past life regression as a spiritual experience. I've actually never met anybody who's very famous, who's not basically also very, very insecure. <laughs> and I think these fantasies that they're coming out with are very often reflection of this insecurity. There is no scientific evidence for the transfer of past life memories to the present life any more, in fact, than there is a scientific evidence of past lives. But I cannot imagine any mechanism whereby memories from a previous life could be transferred to uh, a new generation of people. In a moment, we'll be catching up with Lisa for the first time since her regression, and we'll see what she makes of it all. But first, our historian detective now reveals the results of his investigation. Has he found any truth in Lisa's story? In the 16th century, most of the monasteries in Britain, like this one, Bolton Abbey, were destroyed by Henry VIII but in the rest of Europe, they continue to thrive. In Lisa's regression, she gives us some wonderfully vivid images of monastic life. She talks about the great vaulted ceilings and those long corridors full, of course, of those characters in the brown robes. Not to mention all that really nasty stuff about having to get up at three o'clock in the morning for cold baths and early morning prayers. <laughs> The images Lisa describes certainly paint an interesting story, but are there any hard facts? Perhaps the first and most obvious place to start is with that name, Damino or Demianus. D Deminos or something. Dominos, Dominos, something. Now, it seems to me that Lisa was actually trying to say Demianus, which is no bad thing, because in Italian it means Damien, and he was a very popular Catholic saint. And I've managed to find this picture of a wall painting of him from central Italy. Now, that much seems to ring true. Do you take a new name when you become a monk or not? No. No. Demano, Dema... Deman, Demano. Although Lisa was still struggling with the pronunciation, she was adamant that Domino or Demianos didn't change his name when he became a monk. At this time, there were many groups of monks, each with their own rules and practices. And in the 18th century, nearly all monks would have changed their names when they were ordained. However, there were exceptions to this rule, and one group who didn't always change their names were the Franciscan friars. The Franciscans were devout Catholics and lived like many European monks, but there were a few characteristics that set them apart. The first thing is that they didn't always change their name when they got ordained, and they were also set apart by their very distinctive appearance. And that leads us to our second valuable clue. Can you see what clothes you're wearing, if any? A brown habit sort of thing, like a little cord belt or something around it. This description of a brown habit is surprisingly telling. Different orders of monks wore different colours, black, grey, white, or mixtures of brown and cream and so on. But once again we are led to the Franciscans, who appear to be the only monks at that time to wear a plain brown habit. So, no name change and a brown habit. Things are starting to add up, but there was a third clue. Sometimes we have rich people who visit. They give money. Franciscan friars couldn't own property. And although they were largely self-sufficient for their day-to-day -day living, they were reliant on donations and gifts from merchants or benefactors 
to help support their community. Now, each of these facts may not have sounded like much on their own, but put together, they are starting to add up. Was Lisa's monk a Franciscan friar? But there's just one problem with that. What would a friar be doing, fulfilling the lowly duties Lisa described? I help in the garden. I like um, lettuces and stuff. I, I, I plant them. I like doing that. This kind of labouring doesn't sound quite right for a Franciscan friar. They were more likely to spend their days at prayer or learning. However, the Franciscan community was not only made up of friars, but also lay brothers. We use the term monk as a general title, but there were different levels within their society, and a lay brother would have been dressed in the same fashion as a friar, but he would have tended to the more manual duties. They lived at the monastery, and took care of the crops, the garden, and handled the money. In effect, they were the workers, keeping the whole place running, and the monks in food and warmth. Lisa even hinted at this when she described Damianos as a lowly person of no standing or importance, just like a monk's assistant, a lay brother. Lowly, just, um, just there, not just a guy, just a monk, just a guy, just helping. So we have a name and a role, and a colourful description of a lowly man in a brown habit. Now, of course, we can never be certain, but it's just possible that Lisa's describing the life of a lay Franciscan monk. But whatever the truth of it, it's certain that Damianus's world was soon to be ripped apart, because in Lisa's regression, she talks about this huge fire. It's coming, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to burn, it's going to burn. <sighs> Could the fire have been started deliberately? We don't know, but it was unlikely to have been through any political or religious persecution at that time. But whatever the cause of the fire, it led Damianus to make a big decision. Lisa says that Damianus felt he had to leave the monastery and embark on a long journey. And allegedly, he went from Siena to Venice, and even by today's standards, that's a long trip. Leaving the order would not have been a simple or an easy step to take, and perhaps that's why Damianus travelled so far, to get away from any potential disapproval. The idea that Damianus went to Venice isn't beyond the realms of possibility, because we know that at the time, the wealthy often sought spiritual guidance, and where better for an ex-monk to go. But have we come any closer to discovering if Lisa's monk really existed? That's for you to decide.